How did you get into character to play Andrew in Love, Victor? You know, it's funny, the way I sort of embody a role is probably a little unorthodox in that uh, most of it is sonically driven. I'll listen to a lot of music to sort of find that tone, tune, no pun intended, uh, and then sort of allow my process to continue from there. And this is mostly just a roundabout way of saying Leon Bridges and his song Forgive You uh, sort of led or acted as my mental basis for where Andrew's coming from in a lot of his circumstances. That and um, pretty much anything by The Weeknd. I'm sure if you were to ask Andrew, he would probably say his favorite artist is The Weeknd. Um, but beyond that, I mean, how can you not quickly snap into character and you have such amazing, talented co-stars and actors across from you in a scene? That's probably the, the, the number one reason I was able to actually find Andrew or the inspiration for it was just having such amazing collaborators and creatives, you know, in and around the process. I think what I found and what I hope most of an audience would gravitate towards in terms of themes and motifs found in and throughout Love, Victor is the idea of not necessarily being entirely cognizant of who you are specifically during your formative years and how the show goes to great lengths to tell you that's okay. It's okay to discover who you are over an extended period of time. I'm 23 and let me tell you, I don't entirely know who I am, <laughs> but that's part of the journey is discovering it and to glorify the search and the uh, process of discovering, I think is something Love, Victor does uh, well. And I think it's something, oh, you'll have to let me know. And uh, beyond that, I just, I just hope that people will find the characters relatable. Uh, everyone has depth. Even you watching this, you're deep. <laughs> you have layers. You're like an onion. <laughs> How are you and Luke from Everything is Gonna Be Okay alike? Um, you know, it's funny, I definitely identify and empathize and understand Luke now as an adult way more than I would have in high school considering he and I just, we weren't, I wasn't who I was then at all, <laughs> sort of, of this confidence and self-understanding that Luke had. And I think what's commendable about Luke is he, though he was very self-aware and understanding of what he wanted and what he didn't want, he didn't allow that to affect the way he thought of people so much as he was just willing to be true to who he knows himself to be and not very compromising in that. Uh, which potentially could have been to Matilda's detriment, but she she deserved better anyway. She should have. <laughs> she she gets uh, better in the in the end than Luke could ever offer. So it works out for for them in the in the long run. <laughs> what what attracted you to the story of Booksmart? I mean, easily the people involved. You look at someone like Beanie Feldstein and Caitlin Deaver, who are prolific and amazing in and of their own rights, but you couple that with the directing prowess and ability of Olivia Wilde, who herself is such an amazing entertainer and artist that when you're put at the helm of a film that's telling such a groundbreaking, I would say, or interesting, or just honestly touching and engaging story, it just kind of made for like a recipe of, you know, dynamic storytelling that I knew from the second I read the script, I was like, I, I really want to be a part of that. Obviously you have an audition process, so it's that time it's like, I would love to. Uh, now I just have to see if you would love to work with me. But Booksmart, I think, works to speak to an audience in a way that maybe hasn't up until this point. And if it you know, is speaking to that audience, it's doing it in a way that's digestible and understandable to a broader scope, which I think is the best way to sort of reach an audience is to understand so many different demographics and walk, walks of life and attempt to sort of 
showcase or uplift them in a single narrative. Look at that. I'm a fan of, I'm a fan of Booksmart. I'm a stan. <laughs> What's a movie you could watch over and over and presumably over and over again? Uh, it's probably cheating to say Booksmart. <laughs> so I will probably say, uh, well, there's a few answers. I've watched Lady Bird upward. I don't want to say the exact number, but it's certainly in the double digits. And I probably will add a third digit to that by the end of the year, just because it's, it speaks to a generation, and, you know, allows people, especially, you know, young people I grew up with and seeing them in that light, I was like, you're right. And you, that, that is a perspective that I didn't necessarily think of, if I'm being honest, prior to seeing that movie. So any, any story that'll add empathy to me in retrospect is uh, incredibly commendable. And I loved it. Beyond that, if you haven't watched Dragon Ball Super Broly, it's a really good movie and a lot of fun. And I don't think you have to be super well read or watched or learned on the Dragon Ball mythos, but it's a good movie with great character development. And um, uh, yeah, Gogeta is just really cool. So check that out too, please. Oh, and your name. I'm sorry, I'm an anime nerd and that's coming out now. I don't really have like a, like a home theater because I live in an apartment. But I have this Nintendo Switch that is themed to Animal Crossing. I think that's pretty neat. And if you don't, well, I'm sorry to disappoint you. I have a big fear of disappointing people, and if I did that, I apologize. But just said TV and my Switch. <laughs> um, I don't know if it counts as a podcast or if it would just be like an audio style, you know, I guess that is what a podcast is, but John Green does this series called Anthropocene Reviewed, which if you don't know what Anthropocene means, it's uh, a proposed geological like epoch, which is like period of time uh, dating from the commencement of, you know, relevant human activity on earth. And it's like geological form. It's really great and really touching and very interesting and puts things into perspective because I get pretty bad anxiety attacks sometimes. <laughs> but that's okay because he puts it all into context. And then uh, I also just listened to the Joe Budden podcast. It, he, he's just, he's very funny. <laughs> and I disagree with him probably way more than I agree, but it's something about his editing and the, beep, 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 the air horns. It's a good time. And then, uh, Uh, those are those are the ones I'm listening to right now. I'd be lying if I were like gonna reach into my my bag of podcasts, but yeah. I'd say the best acting advice I've gotten in terms of like the craft of acting was remaining present in the scene, and that's obviously people will tell you that all day, but. I don't know if they necessarily elaborate on what that means. And I would say when I began, I was told by my father, who he himself has a profoundly intellectual look on <laughs> acting and how it should be done. But he made it abundantly clear to me, and now I am to you, that acting is a series of arguments as you're displaying your emotion and you're giving your statement and the other person will, you know, counter argue or provide insight onto another topic and you have to remain present in what they're saying or you won't be able to properly respond with, uh, you know, the correct or reasonable rhetoric. Moreover than that, another piece of acting advice I got that has very little to do with the craft but more so with the business side of it I suppose, is um, nobody prepares you for success. People only prepare you for failure. And I think that's something specifically in a community of people that are often overlooked or, you know, not as listened to, to put it simply. You have to remember that you can succeed. There isn't necessarily some formula, though it is certainly tipped in the scale to benefit 
groups of people over others, but you have talent, you have ability, and you have drive. So long as you stick to those things, you can certainly succeed. Everybody has a different story. Everybody has different types or kinds of privileges, and they're going to use them in whatever way that they can. So just do what you know makes you better, you know, better equipped to perform or better suited for any particular role and harness that and be true to it. <laughs> uh, I like that addition of the, the paid descriptor. <laughs> really narrows it down. Um, my first paid acting job was Ballers on HBO. And my first scene was the one where I'm sitting across the counter from Dwayne Johnson, who, by the way, is a, uh, per just in his presence alone, serves as the perfect motivator to work your butt off and be the best version of yourself that you can be. And I don't even know if he said two words to me outside the scene, but he's just emblematic of, you know, where you want to be at some point. But, um... That was my first, but you know, in college, you'll do anything for free, specifically as it pertains to acting. And I, I just, every student film and every, you know, little short thing I could do, I, I just ate it up. But I wasn't paid for those, so that doesn't really count. <laughs> you know, it's funny, they all required a pretty decent amount of preparation that I don't necessarily know is entirely apparent when you watch it, but people like Nick Hallen in Booksmart and Andrew Spencer in Love, Victor, as much as I guess physically I am those people, sure, I was very drastically different from who they are slash I was in high school, and that can require a certain level of cognitive dissonance in how I viewed myself back then versus who I am now. I'm certainly closer to Nick in essence now, definitely than I was, but certainly than I am Andrew. But in high school, I just, I liked, I played video games and I liked being inside. And then it wasn't until like junior year, I really got into football. But <laughs> you just had a big chunky boy pushing people over and then going home and reading Superman comics like that. <laughs> that was that, that just I don't know. That doesn't strike me as something Andrew or Nick would do. But maybe Luke, he might have that like little aspect about him. I like to think. OK, hold the phone. <laughs> First of all, I feel personally attacked. Kidding. Sometimes. It takes a minute to get there. But the scene that took me the longest to get is not even a scene in which I, I, I mean, it may be led in. So there's a scene, I won't spoil, but in Love, Victor, there is a scene involving a grilled cheese. And if you watch, I reveal said grilled cheese from out from behind my back, which you don't think about being a really difficult move, but I have to, in a suit, maneuver my waist around this plate carrying the greasiest food I think mankind has ever sought to invent. And it slid off the plate. At least, I don't want to say it was any less than 22 times. And it probably took us. It got to the point where they started maneuvering ways to rig the sandwich so it won't fall. In the end, we put a napkin under the sandwich and it's it's still it's still slid because napkins don't you know apply as much friction as necessary to carry out that move. But in the final scene, and you see it, <laughs> spoiler alert, I'm just holding the sandwich and my thumb is all over that, and I move it and I give it to her. Sometimes movie magic is in the eyes of the beholder, I guess. Beasts of a Southern Wild. Uh, here, let me look up when that came out. That movie made, first of all, that made me cry more than I think I have in a public setting in my entire life. And that could be because a lot of the film, you know, I, I just had a lot of sympathy for the characters and what they were experiencing and the 
themes and motif, motifs it sort of shared with a lot of natural tragedies that had happened. But the relationship between the little girl and her father, I think, spoke to me on a level that I wasn't necessarily ready to uh, wrestle with in my own head. And I'd say it came out, Beast of a Southern Wild, 2012. Uh, drama slash fantasy. If you've seen it, you know what it's referring to. And that movie really did it for me. I'm about to cry thinking about it. That movie's really good. Yep. <laughs> it's, uh, that would... <laughs> That would probably serve as the most awkward house piece to have when you have guests over. It's just a photo of blonde you sitting um, somberly on a beach on a leather couch. That would be my Coke ad from Ballers HBO season four, Parker Jones. Listen, I'm not, I'm not pretty enough to get one of those in real life, so it might make sense that I would portray that in a TV show just to, just to maybe, uh, make me feel like I am. That and then um, I maybe steal some socks from wardrobe. I don't do that. Nobody does that. That's it. There's a few like easy answers that I, I'd love to, you know, work across from like Denzel, my dad, people like that where I'm like, you so, intrinsic to the culture that it's like I would be lucky to Will Smith would be an amazing honor um I have such a profound respect for Florence Pugh and I think she's uh amazing in every way uh, am I standing too hard is it too obvious uh and then beyond that See, I mean, listen, Kelvin Harris Jr. is phenomenal. It might be odd. We could play like brothers. I don't know how, what other role we could, but he's incredible. And when I saw him in It Comes at Night, and then again in Waves, I was like, yeah, I could, I would definitely like to, definitely like to work with him. It sounds like I'm calling people out for a rap battle. If you round dog, you let me know. We'll, we'll, we'll eat up some scenes. <laughs> yep. <laughs> ah, I found one that I can just absolutely weeb out on. Weeb is a uh, potentially derogatory term for anime fans who are not of Japanese descent. And I very much am a weebu and I love a Japanese anime. So I'm just gonna uh, plug a bunch of them right now. Uh, Demon Slayer is a phenomenal anime. It can be found on Hulu and Crunchyroll, and it's really good. Uh, moreover than that, uh, My Hero Academia, Academia, Boku no Hero, is on Hulu and Crunchyroll, and it's a phenomenal uh, shonen anime that I think everyone should give it a shot. Uh, Attack on Titan, the first season's on Netflix, so you really have no reason not to watch it. And then the rest is on Crunchyroll. Basically, get a Crunchyroll, uh, which is a streaming service specifically for anime. And then, uh, okay, I'll, I'll stop. Another TV show uh, I watched growing up was The Simpsons. I loved it. I haven't watched in a while, but that was a big one. And then um, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Easily. Easy. Um... Which TV show do you wish you could have been on? Well, I would say like, if they ever remade Smallville or something, I would love to be, I mean, I would I, who wouldn't love to be Superman or a superhero? But I don't know, I, I, I have this weird headcanon dream where I, I, I just wanna dress up as the superhero I'm portraying and like go to like children's hospitals or places to uplift and provide you know, entertainment to, I guess, those less fortunate. Because that's, that's what heroes do. And I, I don't have superpowers, but I can hopefully, you know, 
brighten up someone's life, I suppose, in that. At least in some small way. I, if I went to a hospital now and tried to uplift, they would just be like, who are you? <laughs> but that's okay. It's a process. Um, yeah.